Good afternoon and welcome to the Washington State Department of Agricultural, Agriculture's virtual press conference. My name is Carla Selp and I am the public engagement specialist with the Washington State Department of Agriculture and I'm also an agency spokesperson for the Asian Giant Hornet Project. This afternoon, we'll be hearing from Sven Spieschiger with an update on what we found inside the Asian giant hornet nest that we eradicated east of Blaine. He will be available for questions from members of the press after his statement. We did post a blog late this morning that contains many of the numbers that Sven will go over this afternoon. We also have some photos and videos of our activities from the nest removal and opening of the tree that is uploaded to our box account for media use. Links to the media are available in the media advisory that we sent out yesterday. In order to receive our media alerts and press releases, you have to sign up on our news release listserv, which you can do on our website at agr.wa.gov. One last reminder to please keep your line muted to ensure the best sound quality for everyone. Sven, please unmute your line and go ahead. Okay, can you hear me, Carla? I can hear you and hopefully I will see you momentarily. There you are. Okay, go okay. for it. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking a, a few moments out of your day. Uh, first of all, I'll give a Brief recap of what's happened in the last month here. So on October 21st, uh, Washington State Department of Agriculture trapped a few live Asian giant hornets um, at a private property east of Blaine. On the 22nd, we were able to successfully uh, use a radio tag and track it back to discover the first nest in the United States. On the 24th, which was a Saturday, two days later, uh, we were able to go in the early hours of the morning and perform a vacuum extraction of most of the nest and seal the rest of the nest shut. And then on October 28th, uh, we were able to uh, remove the tree and section it up uh, to uh, get a hold of the section that contained the nest. And we removed that to a cold room uh, at a quarantine facility at Washington State University. And that on the uh, morning of the 29th, we were able to open the nest up and uh, start the process of counting and, and seeing what the nest contained. Over the next uh, few days, uh, Dr. Chris Looney has been doing uh, most of the counting and um, uh, investigation of the comb itself. And uh, we'll, that will continue actually with um, more precise measurements of the combs, but I wanted to uh, give you some numbers. So. Uh, first of all, the nest itself was 8.3 feet high in the air, and this is uh, not entirely uh, abnormal as a small percentage in the native range do nest in tree cavities. Uh, it's usually lower to the ground, though. Uh, the nest itself had six combs, the largest comb being nine uh, inches across, which was about uh, how much room was actually available in the tree void itself. Uh, the stack of combs itself was 14 inches high. The combs contained uh, a total of 776 cells, although that number is um, slightly questionable as some of the uh, cells on the outer edges may have been damaged during the removal. So it was hard to uh, determine uh, whether or not they were actually valid, but uh, generally speaking, we had 776 cells. Uh, there were a number of cap cells, uh, 108. Uh, inside of these cap cells, uh, there were basically uh, queens uh, getting ready to emerge or pupae. And uh, there were 64 cells that had evidence of having uh, insects just recently emerge. And so uh, of, of that, um, uh, we're, we're certain of 64 of them, but uh, as uh, newly emerging hornets uh, emerge from a cap cell, they will generally eat the cap and sometimes leave no evidence. So we can't be uh, certain that that's all, but uh, we're, we're sure of 64 uh, that had emerged. It is our speculation and we suspect uh, reality that after we performed the vacuum extraction on the 24th, that what we found uh, still alive in the nest were recently emerged queens that had emerged after the extraction on the 24th. And um, 
the uh, total numbers we ended up getting uh, from extraction and uh, I'm sorry, from uh, discovery to collecting a few outside the nest uh, the day after the discovery, the extraction, and then the examination of the nest was um, 190 larvae. Most of those were dead uh, when we uh, opened the nest up. 112 worker hornets. And so these are females that are not uh, capable of breeding. Nine male hornets or drones and 76 total queens. And uh, when you add the additional 108 that were in cap cells, that's a total of 495 uh, insects that we were able to, uh, or life stages that we were able to get from this nest. Uh, in the days after the nest removal, an additional three queens were found uh, dead in a, a, a water bucket uh, near where the tree had been removed and an additional two males one caught in a trap right where the nest was removed and one male caught about one road over in one of our program traps. Um, so that is uh, pretty much everything, uh, about 500 hornets out of this nest. And so we're, that's pretty much what we're reporting today. Uh, to put that in perspective, there are nests in the native range that have upwards of 4,000 cells and are capable of producing, you know, seven to 800 queens. Our nest uh, only had 776 cells and about 200 queens total. So with that, Carla, was there anything else I was supposed to cover? No, I think that's it. So now we will be taking questions from members of the media. Um, there are a couple options. You can use the raise your hand function in, uh, go, uh, in WebEx, not go to webinar in WebEx, and I will call on you and I will unmute your line and let you know that you can ask your question. You can also submit questions using the chat function, and I will pose those to uh, Sven on your behalf. So let's just look here. I don't see anyone with a hand raised at the moment. Carla, I think Dave Cunningham is raising his hand for real, not electronically. <laughs> I don't see that, but let me try and get you, Dave. Uh, Dave, your line is unmuted if you have a question. Okay, uh, because I'm in radio, uh, I'm wondering if you could just, first of all, uh, Sven, Eric, pronounce your name clearly for me so I get it right on the radio. And then the sure. second, the second question, well, go ahead and do that first, then the second question. Sure, it's Sven, Eric, Spieschiger. Spieschiger, okay. And if could you describe in layman's terms why it's important to to get rid of these hornets? Oh, uh, certainly. So first of all, this is an introduced species that is not supposed to be here in the Pacific Northwest or in North America at all. Uh, they definitely compete with our native species. And as we were able to observe, they certainly um, can impact uh, wasps and other stinging insects uh, by uh, basically eating wasp nests, and that's going to have an impact on the ecosystem. But most importantly for us here is they are known predators of managed honeybees, uh, which of course we use for pollination of many of our most important crops. And it's just one more thing that, that the uh, managed honeybees uh, don't need to deal with. Great, uh, there's a question here, how many total have been caught? Do you believe there are more nests? Um, so uh, right now on our website, we're listing 20 total captures for the year. Uh, our Canadian counterparts, and I, I see Paul is actually on the call, have also caught a few this year. Uh, we do believe there are additional nests. We had some captures down in the Birch Bay area earlier in the season, and then nothing after that. Uh, we've had some uh, captures over in uh, Blaine. So uh, quite a bit to the west of where we were uh, finding this nest. And then also down in Custer, which is nearby, but uh, far enough away, we would suspect uh, the source is another nest as well. Uh, so um, if you're adding that all together, about 520 total uh, life stages captured this year or killed. And yes, we do believe there are other nests. Great, uh, Michael, we, I'm unmuting your line so you can ask your question. Sorry, having an issue, just one moment. There, you're unmuted. 
Okay. Hey, uh, thanks for answering some questions on this one. I appreciate it. Uh, one quick, uh, just, I'm hoping you can just repeat. You said so about 500 hornets in various stages of life pulled out, correct? And then the question I really want to hear you speak to is just the number of queens that are, are coming out of this uh, nest like this. Does that speak in any way to kind of the exponential nature of, of the threat of these things spreading? Um, sure. Okay. So, uh, first of all, yes, 500 uh, of various life stages. Of that, approximately 200 queens. Uh, we know from the literature that a small percentage of these will go on to form uh, colonies uh, next year, should they, had they been given the chance to escape. Um, it's clear since we captured specimens last year um, and captured a couple of queens early on that a few of them did manage to establish nests here in 2020. And uh, so when you see Albeit a, a relatively small nest like this, able to pump out 20 queen or 200 queens, um, it does give one a little bit of pause because potentially each of those queens uh, could be a new next next year. Now, now obviously there are other factors that will keep that in check to some degree, but uh, there's you know uh, no doubt that had we not intervened and uh, destroyed this nest. Uh, we would be starting with that number of 200 uh, as a possibility. Uh, it really seems like we uh, got there just in the nick of time as our original um, uh, vacuum extraction seemed to only give us workers and we only got queens four days later after we cracked it open. And so if, if any queens had already left the nest, uh, it was just a few and very early. We'll we'll know a little more once we have some time to measure each cell and make a determination of what a queen cell looks like versus a worker cell. But uh, as far as we can tell, uh, we got there just in time. Don Jenkins asks if, if the Asian giant hornets are still in the slaughter phase. Theoretically, yes. Uh, we've not actually received any reports here in 2020. All of our slaughter type reports or events uh, that we suspect were Asian giant hornet uh, came from 2019. And so that is extremely encouraging to us. Uh, we continue to monitor our uh, report lines. And of course, we have a, a special line for beekeepers to call if they're actively experiencing an Asian giant hornet attack uh, of one of their hives. And so, um, you know, we don't expect that it's over for the year, but uh, feel very fortunate that we, we haven't actually experienced one here in 2020 yet. John Ryan, I'm going to unmute your line so you can ask your question. I think you're gonna have to unmute your line. I'm having an issue with being able to unmute lines. Okay, I think you're good to go, John. Uh, we can still not hear you, although your line is unmuted. All right, John, we're going to move on. How about now? <laughs> I can hear you now. I can hear yeah. you, and then I muted you. Okay, you're good. <laughs> My apologies for that. I work radio. I should do better. Um, so I'm confused with the numbers. You just had just a few queens. You think just a few escaped, but then you had said there was a much larger number of cells that you had found that that uh, hornets had had escaped from already. So can you just walk walk us through those numbers again? And sure. secondly, I just wonder if the is the genie just kind of out of the bottle? Is it going to be possible to put it back in s since there's you said there's other nests and there's an unknown number perhaps that have escaped this nest? Is there can you actually uh, is it still possible to really stop this spread? Um, so uh, I'll answer your second question first. Of of course it's still possible. Um, we have you know, over a thousand volunteers out looking and uh, those who aren't actually actively trapping are calling things in whenever they find them. And uh, now that we have a, a little better idea of how to track and uh, locate a nest, uh, you know, we can respond uh, a little more efficiently moving forward. So uh, yes, I'm still cautiously optimistic. If I had told you we had 17 different hits in 17 counties, I'd say the genie was out of the bottle. But uh, right now it's just uh, us and British Columbia, and it's a, you know, a, a fairly contained event at the moment. So yes, absolutely, it's possible. So um, to clarify the question, so there were 108 cap cells. Those queens aren't going anywhere. Um, there were 64 
that looked like they had recently been uncapped. Um, that number may be larger, we're not sure, uh, but what we do know is that after we extracted all workers on the 24th, when we came back in and uh, examined the nest on the 29th, uh, everything that we found alive inside the nest, which would make sense, uh, had likely emerged between the time we did our eradication and the time we did our examination. We ended up with 76 queens there. And so obviously 76 live queens is more than 64 uncapped cells. So uh, some of them obviously did a very good job eating their cap. Uh, but it's it's possible that some had emerged before we did the uh, extract or the um, vacuum extraction and eradication on the 24th. But it's it's not entirely likely. It looks like we got there in time. So some of them may have escaped. Uh, that that is evidenced by the fact that three of them uh, were sort of captured uh, after the fact, hanging around in the area, uh, found in uh, the landowner's um, uh, bucket of water there. Uh, we, it's an unknown number, but it's believed to be uh, a very small number uh, that may have emerged uh, prior to us doing the eradication. Uh, frankly, we're encouraged uh, because of the number of queens we were able to count and kill and uh, basically make an accounting for. So hopefully that answers your question. Great, and Key Relier, hopefully I finally got that right, from the Bellingham, Bellingham Herald asks, um, she's needing some clarification on the number of queens. There was 76 mentioned and 200 mentioned. Can you um, help clarify that number? Sure, um, we said nearly 200. So 108 cap cells that have queens in them or appear to be emerging as queens, uh, plus 76 is almost 200. So. Uh, plus the additional three captured outside the tree afterward. Does, does that clarify? Um, we're, we're not counting the cap cells as actual queens captured, but uh, the cap cells are queens. And so what we are saying is the nest was capable of producing 200 queens and that 76 had emerged inside the nest sometime after we did the extraction and when we opened it. Okay, there's a few questions here that are all related around the queens. I think we've pretty much answered them, but um, there's a question from Cairo Radio. Uh, would the 76 queens have each gone off and started their own colony, net, colony next year? And do you believe there are still two other nests in Whatcom County? Um, so yes, in theory, that's the purpose of the queens is uh, um, if you read the literature um, from Japan and the other parts of the native range, uh, once the queens emerge, they'll hang around the nest for about 10 days, apparently. And at this time, they'll be taking a meal from the workers. Well, we had already removed the workers, so they weren't getting meals. Um, a portion of those actually will never end up surviving uh, because they didn't get enough nutrition before leaving the nest. Uh, the rest of them that leave the nest, uh, should they get proper nutrition, will be mated with um, males, should there be males waiting around outside the nest. And this is kind of how it works with them. And then they will go off and I saw a question pop up in the chat and this should answer that question. They will spend the winter as a mated or an unmated queen, usually in an earthen cell or some other protected area in what we call diapause, which means they're asleep for the winter. And uh, basically that's how they go through the winter. And in theory, they wake up in the spring and a small percentage will go on to found new colonies. So I think that answers that question and then another one I saw in the chat. Great. Um, it's a question from Good Morning America. Did you retrieve all the queens and the rest of the hornets? Do you think you got them all? I think is basically the question. Did you, um, you got them all? There's no way for us to ever be certain whether or not we got them all. Uh, as I said, we uh, we basically, when we did our uh, vacuum extraction on the 24th of October, it was all workers. Um, however, after we removed the nest, uh, there were three queens kind of hanging around the area and a queen from another nest would not necessarily come back to that area. There would be no reason to do so. Uh, so, uh, obviously, there were three, at least three that were out and about. Uh, we would have no way of knowing uh, how many more. Uh, the reason we would have no way of knowing is uh, the hornets are capable of reusing cells. 
And so it is in theory possible that more queens were produced earlier in the year, but it's not likely. And so um, basically from the counts we have, we're very close to having uh, the majority of them, but I can't give you an absolute certainty that we got every single one from the nest. Thanks, Ben. Just going through the questions here. I have a couple of hands raised, but I think that all of those people have already ask their questions. Answer the overwintering questions. Okay, question from Kayla Lafferty. You mentioned some nests can be as big as 4,000 cells, so this would be considered a smaller nest. Why do you think that is and what does it mean? Well, uh... First of all, uh, if we have a population going through from one year to the next that started with one queen, you do kind of have a bottleneck, uh, if you will, genetically speaking, and they may not, they just may not be as healthy as some where you have a, a, a lot of input into the gene pool, so to speak. And so that's one possible explanation. Another possible explanation is the tree itself only had uh, nine inches in diameter for them uh, to grow. And uh, this may have restricted them. And of course, they're a stranger in a new land. We believe the habitat here is actually perfect for them, uh, but it's entirely possible that they may not produce uh, such large colonies here in Washington as they do in Japan or, or other places where they're found. Okay, and there was a question here about how we actually located the nest to begin with. Oh, sure. Um, we have... Uh, we had been working in the area based on a homeowner report, and uh, as, a, as a result of a homeowner turning in a positive uh, specimen, which was ID'd, uh, oh, back in uh, very early October, we ended up placing uh, live traps around the area, several of them. And these are designed to capture hornets who are looking for a quick sugary meal uh, quickly and keep them alive. Uh, we did this on the 21st, and on the 22nd, we were able to assemble a team and tie a radio tag that we borrowed from uh, the USDA uh, to the Hornet. Um, and then we released the Hornet, uh, turned on our tracking gear, and uh, were able to follow the radio, follow the, uh, radio signal uh, back to the nest, and that happened on the 24th. And that's, uh, that's how we were able to locate the nest. So there are a couple of questions about the hibernation, and I, I think you've partially answered them, but there's a couple of questions about um, how hard of a winter can Asian giant hornets withstand? Uh, well, they're found uh, throughout Japan and parts of uh, South Korea, and the, the winters there in some ways are, are more harsh than they are here. So uh, I, I don't know the actual cold tolerances. I, I do know that there's a, a paper Matsumura 1984 that goes over what the cold tolerances are, but I did not have that committed to memory for this uh, particular press conference. Um, we can certainly look into that for you if you, you want to know, but I'm, I'm going to tell you something right now, just because you read it in print somewhere doesn't really mean it's true. Uh, a, a perfect example of this is spotted lanternfly on the other side of the continent. Apparently, if you have 10 degree weather in January, that should be enough to kill every single spotted lanternfly. And the year it was found, uh, we went through polar vortexes, which were much colder than that. And spotted lanternfly is doing fine. It's alive and well. The real issue here is it doesn't really matter how cold the winter gets. If your mated Asian giant hornet queen picks a nice protected area, she will be insulated from that cold and get through the winter. That's why it's an overwintering strategy. So. Um, certainly, if you get sustained periods of cold, their chances of surviving will be smaller, but in general, they will pick a resting area that protects them from this uh, danger and make it through the winter just fine. Looks like Dave Cunningham is raising his hand again. Okay. Um, if I'll, while I find him, I will ask this question. Don Jenkins is wondering, what are the chances of finding another nest this year? Um, they're, they're fair, uh, as long as people keep reporting. Um, we're starting to pull our traps down uh, to be done by Thanksgiving. So uh, the likelihood of us finding it through trapping is starting to wane a little bit as the nights get colder. Uh, the insects have a lot of trouble uh, flying when it's cold out. 
Uh, but uh, should there be an active beehive attack, uh, our chances are very good for finding another one. And certainly as people start going out hunting, uh, they may stumble into one and let us know about it. So uh, the more people are outside and looking uh, this time of year, uh, the more chances we have. So it's possible. Uh, try to remember, uh, we're not even a year into our, uh, since our first detection, which was actually uh, live specimens who that, that were coming to a resident's house December 8th of last year. And we had had several nice cold snaps before that uh, up in the Blaine area. So uh, it's possible we could find another one this year. Okay, Dave Cunningham, if you have a question, go ahead and uh, accept the unmute and ask your question. Okay, we hear in the media these things called murder hornets. I'm wondering what kind of danger they may represent for human beings, if that if that nickname is is over uh, emphasizing the the actual danger, and what should someone do if they come across something that they think might be an Asian hornet? Sure. Um, so, I, boy, do I love common names. Uh, they mess all kinds of things up. So, uh, Asian hornet is actually another species entirely. So, uh, what what we're calling Asian giant hornet is in fact the species Vespa mandarinia. It has many common names throughout the world. Uh, one of my favorite being the yak killer, which to me rolls off the tongue great, but not so good if you own yak. However, uh, the New York Times in researching an article uh, earlier in the year, uh, was speaking to a Japanese uh, researcher who said, we call them murder hornets. And uh, they didn't really go into the reason why they call them murder hornets. Uh, but uh, obviously this is a, a name, the. The general public seems to absolutely love. Uh, it seems like the media loves it too. I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, these are not gonna hunt you down and murder you. If you walk into a nest, your life is probably in danger. I mean, that's that's the sure reality, but your life is in danger if you walk into the nest of other stinging insects as well, especially if you're allergic. Uh, generally speaking, uh, they can be a danger if you sustain multiple stings. Uh, you, I mean, you don't have to seek medical attention, but I, we are strongly recommending if you get multiple stings from an Asian giant hornet nest because you stumbled into one that you seek medical attention. Uh, the venom is uh, delivered at a much larger dose and hornet, these hornets can sting you multiple times, uh, unlike some of our uh, things like uh, managed honeybees here. And so for that reason, they can be extremely dangerous. Uh, there's uh, necrosis associated with the sting, which means the flesh around the sting will start to die, and then this can lead to other problems uh, like organ failure and other things like that. So, um, and in reality, they do actually kill a number of people every year in their native range. Uh, that number is in dispute. I've seen it as high as 70. Most people say it's about 20 people a year, which is comparable with some of the stinging insects you find here in the United States already. Hope that answers your question. Great. Um, question for Michael, how is the Sentinel Hive program going? Uh, it's going strong. We still have them up. We'll, we'll probably have those up through Thanksgiving as well. Uh, we have not had any hive attacks, including our own. And so right now, um, unfortunately, uh, it, it hasn't paid off. But again, uh, we're not sure uh, how effective our traps are. We know they catch them, but we wanted to try every trapping method possible. And the, the Sentinel Hive program was one that showed some promise. And uh, we'll, we'll keep monitoring those uh, throughout the end of the season here. Follow up question about the radio transponders that were used. Was it the same type um, or a different type that was used on the Hornet that was lost earlier in the year? Um, different type. And so the first type of tracking tag we used was Bluetooth technology, and it has a, a much uh, shorter range, which means we can't hear it from as far away. And the battery life is quite a bit shorter, uh, lasting 12 hours, maybe just a little bit more. And so uh, pretty much you have to be able to keep up with it and stay pretty close to it to be able to track it. Uh, we went to a uh, more commercial product, which is also still new, uh, but was being used successfully on the spotted lanternfly program on the eastern half of the country. They were finished with their tags for the year. Uh, the, the shelf life on those tags uh, basically would render them useless by the time their next research season came around. And so they would have gone to waste. So they shipped them out here. We immediately put them into use like two days later after receiving them. 
and got them to work uh, very effectively. Uh, we, we have our own tracking uh, gear here now in Washington, and we'll be returning those to APHIS, uh, but ours are of a similar make and model, if you will. And uh, we were very happy with those. In fact, uh, we were able to recover the tag inside the nest uh, when we uh, uh, examined the nest on the 29th. And uh, it, the, the tag finally stopped blipping probably about two weeks after we activated it. So we got about two weeks out of that, which gives us a, a lot more time should they fly past us. And since they can fly, I believe, up to 50 miles an hour, they're awful fast. Uh, they're a lot faster than us older entomologists trying to chase them through the woods. So uh, just a, a real advantage to switching to that. So John Ryan asks, is there is all the work on giant hornets reducing what can be done on other invasive species? So I think he's this is reference to our resources within WSDA, whether they're being diverted from other uh, invasives. Um, John posed no. a follow up question if I'm incorrect there. Uh, no, actually, uh, this comes from a separate pool of money. The only thing is, is that the people that we have to implement our, our various programs and by other invasive species, I'm assuming you mean things like um, Asian gypsy moth, which we're, we're on top of that. We'll be, uh, Carla will be talking to everybody about that pretty soon, I'm sure. Um, vineyard snail in the Port of Tacoma is going strong. In fact, we're, we're making quite a bit of headway there. And then of course, our survey work for all the other invasive species that attack crops are things that we're um, still on top of. Um, most of these come from separate pools of money though. <clears throat> the only thing I've heard that's actually eating into Invasive species funding, at least from the federal level, is the recent detection of Asian longhorn beetle in South Carolina is going to make us have to tighten our belt a little on other things. But you know what? Uh, we're all in this together. If South Carolina fails on that, maybe we have to deal with it someday. So uh, we're keeping up our end of the bargain here in Washington, and, and they're doing what they need to do over there in South Carolina. So. Nicole Jennings asks, what kind of work is being done together with BC? Um, actually, I was going to ask a question. If you would allow Paul just to give an update if he's willing. Paul, are you willing? And Paul is on here if you could unmute him. <laughs> I sent my request to unmute him. I don't know if he's actually at his desk or ran off and is sort of listening from a distance, but. Um, but yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, Paul's joining us today and uh, we're in constant contact about uh, what we're finding. Uh, right now we're trying to help him out with some lures. I can tell you that. Um, certainly I was hoping he might jump on here and give us a little update on what they're finding, uh, which I don't believe is related to our nest. It's far enough away that it's, it's probably a separate incident, but I don't wanna put words in his mouth. Uh, so I would invite him to log on if he gets the opportunity but um but yes uh, we've been working with them as closely as we can uh we did host uh, conrad baruby who's also with the uh, provincial government up there and uh, he came down to shadow us for a bit hi paul welcome back you willing to speak for a bit we need to unmute you though <laughs> yeah i sent the request to unmute him paul you have to unmute yourself there you go i think you're unmuted well, unfortunately, uh, yes, we have found more specimens and some beautiful specimens, but uh, um, uh, we, the, the, the real epicenter appears to be in your state, not, not out here in British Columbia. And okay. it is only in the border area where we have so far found these, uh, these specimens, and uh, uh, except one that is a male, it turns out quite far away, uh, about 70 blocks. I don't know how many miles that is, but uh, maybe altogether 10 miles north of the border. But the rest of them are all much closer to the border. And um, I have the, the dark suspicion that we do have some nests as well. The one that I picked up this morning was uh, quite a large female, uh, and uh, the submitter wished to keep the specimen, so I cannot do a dissection on it, but I have uh, the strong impression that this was a queen. Uh, I don't know whether she was mated or not, but certainly she will be out of the running now because she's in the deep freeze. Um, but as what uh, Sven already mentioned, we are going to coordinate this again further next year and uh, the whole party will start up again uh, early next spring. 
Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you, Paul. And if anyone has additional questions for Paul or um, the Canadian government, I do have some media contacts for, for them that I can send you. Just reach out to me and I'll be happy to provide that information. Um, next question. Sven, you said this has been limited. Can you estimate the geographical area where the hornets have been found? Um, well, I, I guess a little trouble understanding the question. I don't, I, I don't need to estimate it. Um, I, I know the geographical area where it's been found. Um, if, if you're asking me to guess how far I think it's spread, I believe we are still within just Whatcom County and portions of British Columbia at this point. Uh, we have not seen it uh, south of Bellingham, and the Bellingham find was a queen that was taken out in the spring. So uh, right now, uh, we're just looking at Whatcom County here in the United States and uh, British Columbia uh, just to the north of us. And as Paul just indicated, it's, it's very close uh, to where we're operating as well. Thanks. And I think you asked part of the answer, part of this question already, but the first part, how did they get here? Uh, we'll never know. Um, Pure speculation, but since they overwinter in protected areas as a mated queen, the um, the likelihood is that a, a mated queen came over with some type of international commerce. Uh, could have been a vehicle, could have been wood chips, could have been hay bales, could have been anything really, um, but that is the most likely scenario. Secondary scenarios are somebody smuggled it in to raise them as food. These are sought after food items in their native range uh, that, we have had some interceptions of brood in the, uh, uh, both in Vancouver and in Portland uh, in the past, uh, but that is extremely unlikely. I, I think most people don't want to travel with such a thing, and it would be difficult to do so and then get it established. So uh, to us, it's speculation, but it's likely that it came through international trade as a mated queen. Great, and I believe that is the last of the questions. If you have a question, please go ahead and type it in the chat box real quickly. And um, so another one just popped in. Is your goal to completely eradicate them? Yes, if at all possible, that is definitely the way we wanna go. Uh, the follow-up question that usually comes, is that worth the effort? And uh, absolutely, my answer to that is just look at gypsy moth. It was not eradicated in the east. Uh, we spend a little bit of money every year to eradicate it here on the west coast states. And um, our sprays are not costing millions of dollars of here. They're costing thousands of dollars. In the east, when gypsy moth gets out of control, it costs millions of dollars. And so at least for long term, uh, the, smart, the smart bet here is to eradicate it if we can. And uh, we will uh, obviously make every effort to do that. And uh, with everybody's help, um, hopefully we'll be successful. Um, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the support we've received from the public and our citizen scientists. And with that type of an effort and with everybody looking and uh, immediately calling them in, we actually do stand a, a strong chance. So I'm um, cautiously optimistic we will uh, achieve that goal. It's another question about who eats the Asian giant hornets. Um, I guess, how are they used as food? Oh, uh, sure. So uh, a lot of folks in um, cultures in Southeast Asia actually really prefer to fry up the pupae and uh, some of the brood. And um, I, I've actually had on some of my Facebook friends posting their, their harvest for the year uh, about a month ago. And uh, I got to be honest, uh, these were some friends from Thailand and it, it looked pretty tasty, to be honest with you. But uh, still nothing I, I want anybody growing live here. Uh, you're just asking for trouble if you do that. Uh, and then uh, there's also a few YouTube clips of a couple of journalists uh, eating fried adults. And then, of course, they're also um, submerged in um, uh, alcoholic beverages uh, as kind of like a worm in the tequila sort of deal. Uh, you'll have a, a hornet in your um, in your strong liquor is, is another way that uh, they're used as food items, so. 
Great. I, th I think that's all of the questions that we have. <laughs> and we want to thank everyone again for participating in today's press conference. If anybody is watching this recorded um, and you have questions, if you're a member of the public, you can contact us at 1-800-443-6684 or email us at hornets at agr.wa.gov. Same phone number and email where you can report Asian Giant Hornets. And if anyone from the media needs further assistance, you can contact me directly. My name is Carla Salp. My email is ksalp, S as in Sam, A, L, P as in Paul, at agr.wa.gov. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody.